uh, Legislative Chairman Greg Pulver. Uh, as we're calling thousands of your neighbors across Dutchess County, we'd ask you just to hold for a moment. If you're on the phone and you'd like to ask a question, dial zero. Uh, you'll be asked to record that question, and then when it's uh, your time uh, and we're able to get to you, you'll be brought on live uh, to ask that question. So again, this is County Executive Mark Molinaro. You're joining uh, Legislative Chairman Greg Pulver, myself, on a telephone town hall on Facebook Live uh, this evening. Uh, as we call thousands of, of your neighbors across Dutchess County. So for those of you listening and those of you watching, just give us a minute as we uh, contact Dutchess County residents. Uh, and again, if you're on the phone and would like to ask a question, dial zero. Uh, you'll be asked to record that question and then uh, we'll bring you live to ask it. If you're watching us on Facebook this evening and you'd like to ask a question, uh, you can uh, 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 type it in, correct, Sean? Uh, just type it in the comment section below the live feed and we'll try to get to as many as you can uh, this evening. We're going to be live for about an hour. Uh, how are we doing on calls? Okay, so uh, as we call your neighbors, again, this is County Executive Mark Molinaro. If you're on the phone with us this evening, dial zero. You can ask a question. Uh, we'll ask you to record that question. Uh, and then we'll bring you live uh, to ask it. Uh, we'd like to cover a few items tonight, a little bit of an update on our COVID-19 uh, data, uh, also a bit of an update on the county's fiscal condition. In just a, a couple of weeks, I'll release uh, my proposed 2022 budget, uh, and um, we'll uh, want to talk a little bit about the county's uh, fiscal uh, condition. Uh, but uh, Mr. Chairman, thanks for joining us well, this evening. Thanks for having me. It's always a pleasure to sit next to you at one of these uh, teletown halls and, and discuss county business. Well, I appreciate it. Uh, we're waiting, uh, as we call thousands of neighbors across Dutchess County, when I get the thumbs up, uh, we'll kind of get started a little bit. Uh, and uh, in the meantime, though, um, Greg, uh, you know uh, today uh, Dutchess County lost a, a legend. Um, Absolutely. A, a very uh, dear friend of ours. Uh, actually, probably thousands of Dutchess County residents could call uh, Sheriff Butch Anderson a friend. Uh, perhaps the most uh, generous, uh, uh, certain certainly person uh, I've ever known. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, and uh, is truly a, a living legend uh, in in this community. Fifty years with the Dutchess County Sheriff's Office, and for this time as sheriff, uh, really helped to transform the sheriff's office uh, into uh, by by you know all measures uh, one of the most uh, effective. Uh, law enforcement entities in the state Absolutely. Uh, and as he would say uh, the Dutchess County Sheriff's Office without uh, uh, question is uh, second to none. Yep, his famous statement um, he uh, certainly put uh, servant into public servant and uh, he did a lot of stuff behind the scenes that nobody probably will ever realize what he did helping the uh, the poor and, and, and downtrodden and was always an advocate for uh, you know, treating people the way you wanted to be treated, uh, another one of his catchphrases, and it's certainly something that we all should live up to. I agree. Um, uh, uh, it's also uh, important that, uh, and I know you share this on behalf of the residents of Dutchess, we extend our thoughts and prayers uh, not only to uh, the Anderson family, his wife Danielle, his four children, uh, but also the men and women of the Dutchess County Sheriff's Office, uh, who I, you know, we we know, uh, Butch Anderson loved and respected, um, and uh, um, uh, we uh, certainly know this is going to be a difficult time for them. Yeah, and, and, and certainly this. treated them as family. Um, there was there was no doubt that uh, there was a special bond between the the the, the group and, and himself, and they looked up to him. And uh, as any true leader, he uh, he led by example, and and will be sorely missed mm -hmm. by the by those in the in the field no doubt so uh, this is uh, County Executive Mark Molinaro you're joined this evening uh, uh, by uh, I'm joined this evening by uh, chairman of the Dutchess County Legislature Greg Pulver we're calling thousands of Dutchess County residents to join us for this telephone town hall on Facebook live if you have a question and you're on the call tonight on the phone tonight dial zero and we'll ask you to record that question uh, when we get to you we'll bring you live to ask it if you're following us on Facebook and want to ask a question simply write it in the comment section below the live feed we were just commenting on uh, the very sad uh, passing of Sheriff Butch Anderson here in Dutchess County uh, and uh, we know that uh, uh, many Dutchess County residents knew him well and uh, we all uh, are, are heartbroken today uh, I've been asked a couple times uh, today and would like to uh, at least uh, provide some some uh, insight uh, so uh, in the case of a vacancy in the, in the case of the sheriff 
uh, the undersheriff uh, serves uh, until the governor of the state of New York uh, fills the appointment. There's some very technical issues as to timeline and what have you, but the governor of the state of New York is able to fill that vacancy. Uh, but uh, until that time, um, uh, Kirk Imperati, the current undersheriff, will serve as acting sheriff of Dutchess County. And I'm hopeful, and I think you agree, uh, and certainly feel free to say so, uh, there is, uh, I think, no one more prepared nor more appropriate uh, to succeed Bush Anderson as sheriff of Dutchess County than Kirk Imperati. And so um, we're hopeful that that is the appointment that gets made, and uh, we'll certainly advocate on his behalf. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I think that in, in, in this case, in, in a tragic uh, death of the sheriff, um, it would give peace to the to the uh, rank and file if uh, the under sheriff would, you know, get appointed to that position just to add stability. Um, they you don't need to uh, stir the pot politically um, during this this uh, sad season. That's for mm -hmm. sure. And in the case of the sheriff's office, uh, as many of you know, listening, uh, we're in the midst of uh, reform measures that the sheriff's office has put in place uh, that Kirk has been uh, very much involved with. Uh, a refocus on community policing, school resource officers, uh, the investment in mental health and crisis intervention, all of that is ongoing. Uh, but also the construction of the new uh, Justice and Transition Center, which is two years from, from being completed and occupied. And uh, frankly, this just isn't the time to uh, uh, to break that that, that continuity. So we're exactly, exactly. Sure we'll, so let's talk a little bit about uh, where we are with some of the COVID numbers. We're currently monitoring 630 active cases. You know, we I've said this uh, before, and I, I was saying it last week. Uh, we were hesitant to say uh, that we um, uh, that we're uh, trending downward, but it it does seem that we're beginning the trend downward, uh, which is both expected based on what we saw in other countries and what we expected based on vaccination rates and uh, uh, the fall season right. it was uh, historically we saw this uh, this spike uh, uh, last year begin to come down. So numbers have plateaued. We're down from 795 active cases at the beginning of the month. Uh, we've now held below um, uh, uh, 700 for six of the last uh, eight days, and uh, we expect uh, currently to see that that trend uh, continue. Now, the one thing to note: the largest number of new cases uh, are in the 10 to 19 years of age and the 20 to 29 years of age group. They represent 17 percent. It's a little bit different. We we had been um, uh, not seeing um, as many new cases in the 10 to 19 uh, age group or age bracket, but uh, we are seeing that. Not that it's an alarming change, it's just a bit of information people should know. And then of those interviewed, because again, um, you know, uh, we call if you've tested positive, you answer the phone or you don't, we hope you do. You ask, answer a few questions or you don't, we hope you do. Yeah, right. um, of those interviewed, 80% uh, of our new cases are among those who are either not fully uh, or not at all vaccinated. And, and I said this last week, I am not passing judgment, uh, but it is important at least to understand some of the data right. that where, we see. Where that is coming from. Right, right, and that's all. I mean, I do think that vaccinations are a matter of choice. Absolutely. I continue to advocate for that. Uh, regardless, by the way, we got a lot of questions about that. I actually do believe, even, even in the case of employment, uh, uh, I think that vaccination uh, should be a choice. Uh, not a mandate. Uh, and in fact, we have tools and mitigation steps we've been able to use to slow the spread of the virus uh, over the, uh, we've learned this over the course of the last two years. And I, I don't think such a harsh measure as uh, mandating that as a term of employment is, is necessary or appropriate, uh, and we'll continue to say so. Uh, but uh, in this case, 80% uh, um, uh, of those new cases uh, identify as either individuals who have e either not been vaccinated or only okay. partially vaccinated. Now, testing is up, which is useful. We're uh, now testing uh, 1,985 daily uh, tests. That's the average of the last uh, seven days. School testing is underway. Um, I will say we've received a few calls from residents, and I understand this. Uh, some uh, residents are not happy. Uh, they work for a school district, don't like the test that's being ava made available to them. Um, we're providing school districts the opportunity through a grant secured by the state uh, to select which provider and which test they'd like to make use of. Uh, they are using the lower uh, nasal, the shorter nasal uh, um, uh, uh, swab. Uh, it, you do have access to other testing opportunities, and you may want to consider those if you feel more comfortable with them. Uh, we don't have the ability to 
um, prohibit the testing requirement in the county. No county has the authority to undo what the New York State Commissioner of Health has done. Now, uh, that is an order by the state uh, that uh, all staff at schools either be tested or vaccinated, tested weekly or vaccinated. And so we're offering this as a tool that, that people can use to mitigate having to go all over right. the place for that test. But you can certainly choose uh, not to, to, to take advantage of this testing that's available. But we, we can't direct the school district as to what it is they can or cannot do. We're just trying to make it available to them to minimize the impact on as many people uh, as possible. In the meantime, you know, with the numbers trending down where we are a, a bit more comfortable, uh, certainly as a county, that we're headed in the right uh, direction. Um, averaging 60 new cases daily, that is down from 75 new cases daily. The seven-day rolling average uh, positivity rate is now 3.3%. Uh, that is, uh, we've, we've held a below 4% uh, uh, for the last seven days, very important. Um, 23 hospitalizations. Uh, we've been under 30 for the last six days. Uh, and uh, the last time this was the case was in early August. So at least we're seeing progress there. I talked about this last week. Uh, sadly, we have 500, excuse me, 490 of our neighbors to come to the virus. Uh, we talked in detail about some of the data uh, that we understand and, and some of the uh, uh, variables uh, uh, and, and details related to these uh, fatalities. Of course, anybody who dies of anything uh, is, is, is obviously heartbreaking. Um, but what we did identify is overwhelmingly uh, those who have passed of, uh, with COVID, um, uh, uh, those who are vaccinated um, have uh, significant comorbidities. And then we identify that with our healthcare providers and those who have been uh, partially vaccinated or not vaccinated at all um, still mostly have some degree of comorbidity right. at this point. Uh, so it's important uh, to know. Uh, 40 patients on average uh, at the hospital. Uh, as I said, we were down below 40 these last seven days, but the average now is 40 over uh, the month of September. 79% of those uh, patients uh, ident uh, identified as either partially or not vaccinated at all. Again, not passing judgment, just information uh, used as a, as a means of giving us uh, some insight as to uh, as to what we're what we're addressing. 21% identified as fully vaccinated uh, and, and so on. Uh, Dutchess County now is uh, nearly at 77% of adults have chosen to be vaccinated uh, with uh, those uh, 80, excuse me, 55 years of age or older uh, have a vaccination rate of 85 to 99%. And uh, that again, uh, we believe uh, is uh, by choice. Uh, we hope uh, I chose to be vaccinated. I chose to be vaccinated. Uh, and um, uh, But we do believe that it is uh, your choice to make that uh, decision, and it ought to be. Uh, so that's where we are at vaccination rates. Uh, if you have a question and you're on the call this evening, dial zero. Happy to ha answer a few questions. If you're following us on um, uh, Facebook and have a question, happy to take one or two if you got one. We have one so far. <laughs> you don't look pleasant. Sean's like... <laughs> Um, okay, why haven't COVID vaccines been mandated for all county employees, others, uh, uh, obviously? Uh, because I believe it should be your choice. I do. Um, this, is, this has been my perspective. If you say we have a problem uh, and you have a, a solution to fix that problem, well, then I'm happy to consider it. We are not seeing um, a case where county employees are adversely impacted. Therefore, um, we've been taking mitigation steps internally. Uh, certainly here in county government, many uh, choose to wear their mask. I wear my mask in, in congregate settings in this building, uh, although I find myself walking down the empty hallway. Uh, sometimes the mask on, I do take it off at that point when I realize there's no one no else in the hallway. Right. Uh, but that said, um, um, uh, you know, we're not seeing a spread among county employees. We have a very high vaccination rate uh, among gen generally among all employees. I think we're in the 76% area. We have much higher vaccination rates uh, among those who have higher sensitivity employment, uh, meaning they're working among a lot of people. Uh, those uh, who may not have, uh, may, may, we have, may have a lower rate. Um, but at the end of the day, that's uh, what we think is appropriate. If, the, if there was a problem that could be solved by Dutchess County employees being mandated to be vaccinated, then I'd listen to that as an argument. But I don't happen to think this is a vaccine that ought to be mandated in the employment setting. Correct. And so uh, we are not moving forward with that mandate. We encourage our, res our employees uh, to choose to be vaccinated. And I believe that that is uh, appropriate based on what we're seeing, data, demographics, right. and information. And we, and we provide uh, opportunities for them to be vaccinated, and we provide the, the background materials on why they should be vaccinated. But again, I agree with you. It's, it's up to um, everybody's personal choice when it comes to 
whether yeah. they want to get vaccinated. Or yeah. Not. Now some are listening, saying, "Yeah, but if more people get vaccinated than this, every time uh, we get to the next marker, somebody says, yeah, but if more people than this.' Uh, at this point, what we want to see." Um, that, remember, we began this uh, uh, this pandemic with the understanding that we were trying to slow the spread to protect the healthcare in, in infrastructure right. and your own health. We and we didn't know certain things months and months and months ago. We know certain things now. There are mitigating steps that we can take. We we were concerned that COVID was on the surfaces of everything, so we began cleaning everything. And then, of course, they told us, well, it doesn't really last very long in those flat right. settings. So. Uh, we we thought that uh, that 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 you you know there were certain things like going to the gym was was a higher risk than than not. We learned that that's not true. As you learn this information, you then have to process right. that and make make appropriate uh, policy decisions. And we think that this is the appropriate one that that uh, uh, that making the choice to be vaccinated is is most appropriate under the circumstances. So uh, that's why we are where we are. But thank you for the question. I understand why some might disagree, uh, but that is the position we take. Uh, if you have a question this evening, dial zero. Uh, we'll happily take that question, bring you live. Um, um, why don't we go to, uh, well, we can go to Jim. I think he has a similar question. Jim had a question regarding mandatory vaccination for employees. Jim, are you with us? I am. I know Jim. I know Marcus. Uh, what's your question, sir? Um, I was questioning whether we were going to go mandatory vaccination for county employees to public sector, especially with the health department, home health care nurses, food delivery services, and, uh, you know, the people who are engaged with the public on a regular basis. So, I know that New Vance Medical is moving forward with insisting upon vaccination for their employees at all the local medical centers that um, they're involved with. Yeah. So, so I was just curious if we were that way, but you've already answered that question. I did, but I will say there are certain employees uh, that are mandated under the governor's order, the New York State Health Department order. There are some employees uh, that fall within the healthcare sector that are mandated under the state order, not not a local decision, uh, and frankly fall uh, fall under that that requirement. But that said, again, I you know I do continue to believe that. Uh, vaccination in this case is as a condition of employment is not not appropriate and that's that's my view uh, but thanks Jim for the uh, uh, for the question I appreciate that uh, if you're online uh, and you have a question on Facebook simply write it in the live feed underneath the uh, excuse me in the comment section underneath the live feed if you're on the phone and like to ask a question dial zero uh, Chris we're gonna go to Delora I think Delora had a question regarding contact tracing are you with us Yes, I am. Hi, Howard. Did I get it right? Is it, is it Delora? Yeah, I see. I follow you all the time. I'm in the village of Millerton. Wonderful. I have a question about contact tracing. Um, I've been trying to find out. I see the jobs are appearing again, but when you go to apply, you kind of led down a rabbit hole. Um, are they still doing it? And if so, what's the right place to go for that? Well, to, uh, to inquire. So uh, they are still, the state of New York is still hiring contact tracers. The county is not because caseloads have come down so much that basically contact tracing, even though um, you're told it's a health department contact, most of the time it's a New York State uh, uh, contractor, that uh, employee that handles it. Um, the right answer is to visit uh, the New York State Department of Health website. Uh, but if um, um, if I can find out where you might find that on our website, I'll, I'll let you know. But uh, uh, but uh, visit uh, New York State Department of Health. Uh, and sadly, uh, I do know that their website is at times a little bit complicated. Uh, but that is that is the entity. The state is the one handling those the, uh, those jobs and that employment. But there are still opportunities for that. I have another question about nurses giving immunizations. There seems to be a lot of confusion. I we live um, we're kind of remote here, but I'm retired, and I think that um, we they should tap into the work, the retired nursing pool that's available in the area. For I was not. To vaccinate, I'm going to do it for free. I just want to get it done. And um, I went to CVS, and they said the policy for New York State was, oh no, nurses can't give um, <laughs> nurses can't give vaccines in pharmacies. It's like I can't get the right answer to do what is the right thing to do because I really do want to help. 
Well, uh, there are a couple things. Uh, there may be a prohibition in a in a pharmacy setting, uh, but you can volunteer uh, to be a vaccinator. Uh, you can do that uh, um, with the state, or you can do that with us. Although uh, they're limited, uh, you know, we're not we're not getting as many interested parties uh, to be vaccinated. Many people are doing that through their doctor's office or what have you. There doesn't seem to be a major. Uh, concern for access, but the Dutchess County Medical Reserve Corps, and if you visit duchessny.gov, duchessny.gov, okay. our Medical Reserve Corps, you can sign up to be a volunteer, and uh, one of the tasks of, the, of that group is uh, to, uh, to, to provide assistance with vaccination, uh, depending on demand. Uh, but n nurses are able to conduct vaccinations in other settings. I, there may be some reason why you can't do that in a pharmacy. There's always some extra rule in New York, but, but that would be the... Uh, uh, that would be the right place to go. Okay? Thank you. You're very welcome. Thanks very much. If you have a question, you're following us on... If you're following us on... Hello? Yeah, we're going to catch you. <laughs> uh, if you're following us on Facebook, uh, simply write the question in the comment section below the live feed uh, or dial zero on your phone and we'll be happy to get you live. We want to get a little bit to some financial uh, information and a bit update on our fiscal uh, conditions. So as I mentioned, uh, in, in two weeks, three weeks, three weeks, uh, I'll be releasing the 2022 county budget. And we are so looking forward to that. I know. I know. You're it's waiting. It's highlight of the year. <laughs> <laughs> okay, watch it. Um, all of a sudden, Greg thinks he's a comedian. Um, uh, you're joined this evening by County Executive Mark Molinaro and um, uh, what's his name? Uh, <laughs> Greg, uh, uh, Greg Pulver is chairman of the Dutchess County Legislature. This is our telephone uh, town hall and Facebook Live town hall. Uh, if you're online, on the phone with us this evening, please dial zero, uh, and uh, we'll, uh, if you'd like to ask a question, and we'll happily get you online to ask that question. If you're following us on Facebook, uh, simply uh, type your question in the comment section below uh, the live feed. So um, I think it's, listen, it is fair to argue that um, first, uh, no county came into the COVID crisis in a stronger fiscal condition than we did. Correct. Uh, among the highest bond ratings uh, of any county in the state. Uh, we've held spending to about 1.5% annualized growth over the last decade. Uh, and at the same time, uh, we've been able to focus uh, I, on community priorities like mental health, community uh, safety, public safety, uh, senior services, veteran services, parks, infrastructure, um, all while cutting taxes. Yeah. Uh, now, um, right as of today, uh, with the growth in uh, sales tax revenue, um, I don't know that we've ever been in a stronger fiscal condition than we are today. Uh, and if you want to get to a couple of the initial points, we wanted to cover a little bit of the 2020 uh, financial statements. Yeah, uh, re released by our independent auditors. Um, you know, our, our fund balance, which is our, you know, rainy day fund, kind of, um, has increased uh, from $57 million to $60 million. And And people may not realize, but when you took office, we had no fund balance. We had virtually no fund balance <laughs> yeah. identified. Uh, we were right. thankful that we were able to, and, to recover. And we, we, you know, being smart and efficient and, and, and uh, taking care of the taxpayer dollars, we were able to do that. And, and it's not that we're squandering the money or, or holding it. We're giving it back and doing programs. Um, the IT and cyber audit um, that was done advises that Duchess is a model for other counties. So we are, we are looked at by the state and, yeah. and the federal government also by showing that we are doing things right. Yeah. Um, and, and I think the Stabilization Center is one of our shining examples of that. I know, um, you know, the, 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 the legislature worked hand in hand with you to get that done, but it, it just shows the wise use of money and, 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 and taking the mental health crisis that the state dumped on the counties and we did something about it and made it our own. Sure. So we're very happy. And of course, um, our good friend, Tom DiNapoli, the controller, who tends to spend some time in an inordinate amount of time in, in Dutchess County. County. <laughs> um, he, he, he spoke at the last um, uh, naturalization ceremony with me, and uh, it was good to see him. Um, you know, his uh, has done a fiscal stress rating of all the communities, and we're at 12.9 out of 100, um, which is the good side of, of that, because there is no designation between zero and 40. Yeah. So we are... Um, we're in great shape financially, and, and I think that, you know, certainly your leadership, but working with the legislature, being open with the legislature on, on, on what you need to get accomplished as the chief executive officer here, and, and us, you know, making sure that we're spending the money the right way. Yeah. And I think we've done it. No, I think it's, uh, we have a good, uh, we, as I said, I, we, we, are, we are likely as strong as you can be financially, and certainly uh, I, I don't know in recent history we, when we've been stronger. 
Um, we are seeing a steady a rebound in sales tax receipts. Uh, sales tax um, uh, is about 33% higher. So we've collected uh, approximately $36 million. We're at 33% higher at this point in time this year than we were last year, which is somewhat uh, understandable, but we're 20% higher than the 2019 budget, which is really the budget we use as sort of a reference point. 20, right. pre 20, yeah, pre-COVID. 2020 was uh, this moment in time that uh, from a financial perspective, right. it's hard to to, to kind of judge against. And we, and we were scared. I mean, when we went into 2020, we all didn't know. There's great unknown about what the budgetary um, constraints were. And again, we uh, we shrunk county government as we saw fit. And now we're coming out of the other side, hopefully yeah. the other side anyway. Yeah, and at this rate, if sales tax uh, continues at the rates uh, we're seeing, um, you know, we're obviously going to not only recover a great deal of revenue, but we're also going to be sharing a significant amount of money uh, with towns, villages, and cities. Earlier this week, we advised the supervisors and mayors that they should prepare for a pretty substantial increase in, in sales tax growth next year from this year. Right. And uh, it's important, right? So as they're developing their budgets, towns, villages, and cities right now, they many of which will many of them will have seen a, a significant increase in mortgage tax receipts. And for next year, we, counties don't get mortgage tax; right. uh, they do. Uh, but next year, they'll see a significant increase in sales tax as well. It's important that they know that. Now we're going to be advancing a lot of that um, uh, uh, in in the budget over the course of the next couple of months. Um, and because we've seen such a high increase uh, in in revenue, sort of recaptured revenue along with the decisions we've made that helped us protect that fund balance. Uh, the county is moving forward with reducing overall debt in 2021 uh, by nearly $5 million. Now that, that savings, that retirement, if you will, will or, or reduction of debts uh, will allow us uh, to save about $430,000 uh, uh, annually, or no, excuse me, collectively from 22 to 23, and that'll uh, help us reduce debt service by about a mil uh, million dollars, just over a million dollars. All of that, did I get that right? I did. Yeah, Re we'll reduce debt service in 22 by over a million dollars. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I want to make sure I got it right. I got it right. Don't don't tell me I got it wrong. Um, uh, uh, but uh, uh, they're they're all here to make sure we got it right. right. Uh, but uh, because we have the ability to use those resources, we're able to retire debt or not assume debt. In fact, we'll be moving forward uh, with a few capital projects with. Uh, with basically cash. So we're not indebting future generations, right. we're not taking on the interest payments, and uh, we're able to uh, reduce the overall debt service commitment that the county's right. making, that payment, like your mortgage payment, right? We're reducing that. So all of that's pretty uh, pretty important. Um, and um, <laughs> um, uh, and uh, uh, from our perspective, sets us in a, in a good, uh, good financial right. condition. Now, over the course of the next couple of weeks, we'll be announcing a few of the 2022 budget uh, uh, initiatives. We won't do that today. No. We've got another town hall coming up. We'll get to it uh, week in and week out. Uh, but uh, I will say again, uh, Dutchess County is uh, in as strong a f fiscal condition as we've ever been. And fr frankly, I, I don't know in recent history when we've been stronger than we are today. Right. And I'm grateful that you gave me some credit. But the truth is, we have a good partnership. We do. We do. Um, there are some people who you know think that the legislature just you know just kind of nods its head in agreement. They're wrong. Right. Um, I think between uh, the leadership, and I say this on both sides. Right. Republican and Democrat, you poke, prod, ask questions, and uh, you know really engage in the in the oversight. Right, and I don't, you know, it doesn't have to be confrontational, public. You know, we can we can have certain disagreements, and we can get ask these questions and get the understanding, and we can do it privately. And then once we have a good, you know, co uh, a feeling about things, then we can move forward. Yeah. Um, we don't have to show. You know the, the stuff that happens in Albany and Washington here in Dutchess. We we try to avoid that, yeah. and we work well with. With both sides of the aisle, I mean, we, we, we certainly ask you tough questions when 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 the time is needed. But again, we, we try to do what the, what's always right for the for the taxpayers and our constituents. Yeah, I um uh, and and I agree. I, I just because we're not fighting about it in public doesn't mean that the questions don't get asked right. uh, or the answers given. Um, and I will also say that there's never been a moment where uh, the administration has outwardly or outrightly uh, denied access to information. <laughs> uh, you right. know, it's like if you ask a Republican or Democrat, we may have to compile it. It might take a little longer than you want. Um, but in every case, uh, the administration tries uh, through the budget office or the appropriate departments to get that information to the legislature to help answer questions. So if ever a legislator says, I asked questions, but you didn't give us answers, they're not telling the truth. Uh, we ultimately give the answers. It's just sometimes we have to get it right, right. and be accurate about it. <laughs> but that said, um, uh, we are in good financial condition. If you have a question, uh, dial zero on the phone. 
uh, happy to get to your question. If you're following us on Facebook, write your question in the comment section below the live feed uh, and we'll get to them. Um, let's get to what is the status of contract negotiation with county employees, especially those who work through the entire pandemic. Okay, so um, I will offer to you whether they worked through the entire pandemic or didn't, every one of our collective bargaining units have their own schedule. Um, so CSEA, which is the largest uh, union representing uh, Dutchess County residents, that's the bulk of our county employees, their contract comes to an end this year, 2000 and, or, or no, I'm sorry, it came to an end in 2000, excuse me, I apologize, came to an end, this is 2020. At the end of 2020, that was when their contract concluded. CSEA agreed, and we saw, we agreed with them, uh, that to negotiate in the midst of the pandemic would probably not have resulted in, in getting a fair consideration for the union or us. So now that we have rebounded uh, financially, uh, we've begun the conversations with CSEA. They have some specific items uh, and we have some specific items. At the same time, CSEA went through a change of leadership. Liz uh, Parano, who had been chair, had been president for a number of years. Now, Andy Calamari is president of the uh, union. I believe, yeah. Um, I yeah, hope so. I hope I got that right. I think I got it right. Um, uh, and so they went through some leadership change. Now that that's situated, we have begun contract negotiations with them. I am hopeful we get that wrapped up this year, uh, but we'll you know we'll see. Um, uh, that said, uh, we are engaged in those negotiations. Um, pop, uh, the PBA, which represents the sheriff's office, uh, uh, road patrols, and and, and uh, sheriff's uh, portion of the uh, sheriff's office, uh, the civil and, and, and road patrols, they are in contract now. They're in the midst of their contract now. The correction uh, officers uh, are up at the end of this year. So the uh, 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 DCSEA, which represents the corrections officers, they're at the end of this year, and we have begun conversations. In fact, we've had several meetings with uh, leadership. Uh, they, too, had the understanding and appreciation that if the union negotiates in the midst of a, of a pandemic, uh, and our fiscal condition was unknown, that probably would not have resulted in the best deal for them. Um, now, maybe the, maybe, you know, the, the, the county is, is, is obviously in a better fiscal condition now, so we're, we're, having more, uh, we're, we're able to have a more realistic conversation with them. So all of that is underway, and then the last collective bargaining unit is DSA, which represents the attorneys for Dutchess County government. Uh, that we settled, and the legislature just ratified, I think, two months ago, yes. that contract. So... DCSCA, largest union, they went through leadership changes. They wanted to wait through 2020. We began in 2021. Now we hope to be able to wrap that up in short order. Uh, PDA is in contract, so there is no new negotiation underway, and that is not necessary uh, at this point. I think they have one or two more years left in their contract. Um, DCSEA, which represents the corrections officers, we are having conversations with the hope and expectation that we can get to a contract uh, pretty pretty rapidly, a fair one, and, and we understand what their concerns are and we have to negotiate those. We're talking through them. And then DSA, um, and then DSA uh, represents our attorneys. That was approved already and that is now through the next couple of years. Okay, um, let's try to get to... Um, uh, Rick had questions about the side effects of vaccines. I may not be the best person to answer, uh, but uh, why don't we get to Rick? Are you with us, Rick? Yes, I am. Go right ahead. My concern is that, in general, there is no national health program at all, so the information that we get from the news doesn't really make sense because it's all regional. So within the region of County, what are the side effects to your knowledge? Side effects of the vaccine? We are, we are yes, seeing, sir. We're seeing about the same percentages that you see nationally. Uh, we are not, we don't get that information provided. If there's a side effect related to a vaccine that's, that's filed with uh, the CDC, uh, what is it called, the VAERS report? Uh, so you can go online and identify that information, but the side effects as it relates to, known side effects as it relates to vaccination in Duchess resembles the uh, the national numbers. There, there is not a, uh, a, a, a larger number of any one uh, of the vaccinating the vaccination side effects. And I do want to offer, uh, yes, it is true that individuals can be vaccinated and can react differently to it. Everything from simply soreness of your arm to, in certain cases, it can be it can it can affect your your life. But that is the truth with any 
well, quite frankly, any foreign thing you put in your body, but with any of the vaccinations. But we are seeing the same basic percentages within the county and the region as shows in the national FDA, and, and I believe it's the CDC reporting. And it's, uh, I, I, call, I said it's VAERS, but uh, maybe Sean can remember. Uh, there's a reporting mechanism that you can report side effects, and you and I can go on that, that and actually look at it online. That is available to you, and I believe you can regionalize it to a degree. So I, I do appreciate uh, that question. We had a couple questions regarding mental health. Do we want to go to Carrie Ann? Carrie Ann's on the call, uh, on the line. Um, if you're with us, Carrie Ann, go right ahead. Hi, thank you for uh, taking my question. Um, was just wondering if uh, what the county might be doing uh, about mental health and uh, things like resources. Are we going to be opening up maybe more facilities? Uh, I've noticed that there has been, you know, quite an increase in mental health issues um, in the area and also a number of suicides has increased in the area. So I was wondering if uh, what the, the county might be doing to help that out. Great, great question. I will tell you that prior to the pandemic, um, and, and that hasn't changed with, uh, with COVID, but we we began a very concerted effort to expand mental health services. And I will say absolutely, without any question, Dutchess County has the most comprehensive network of mental health services uh, in, in the country. That said, there are still gaps in service and tools that still need to be needed. So I will tell you, uh, we continue to expand our mobile intervention uh, team capacity. So we're out in the, out in the community. Uh, we continue to, uh, uh, to expand uh, access to the stabilization center. Uh, which is unlike any other uh, facility in the country. Uh, we did launch, and hopefully uh, at some point next year, we'll have a mobile unit, a, basically a mobile mental health unit, uh, thanks to a grant that Assemblymember Dee Dee Barrett secured for us and some fun funding that we're using through the American Rescue Plan to, uh, to implement a, a mobile unit. Uh, at the same time, uh, we've expanded our drug treatment uh, facil uh, opportunities, and we are putting money through the ARP toward long-term care um, but that said, long-term care, those, law, those beds, the, the, the lack of access to bed and, and, and sort of long-term treatment is not unique to Duchess. The state of New York actually authorizes the number of beds. So you can't just one day wake up and, 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 and put 500 in your community. The state actually authorizes it, and they have frozen new authorization of beds in the region for the better part of, of the last several years. And so we're really pressing on the state. We can... We can continue to invest in the in the interim, right? The emergency, the intervention services, but it's the long-term care that, right. that we need help with, right? Especially in juveniles, um, uh, you know, we, we are sorely underserved in beds with juveniles. As a matter of fact, there are no beds in Dutchess County uh, for juvenile mental health issues, and, and we are advocating strongly to the uh, uh, state to, to change that. And we have partners that would would welcome uh, those beds, but again, as 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 the county executive said, we we are kind of handcuffed by the state. Uh, but but I assure you, we are we are putting pressure um, as much as we can on the state for those long-term mental health beds, both juvenile and adult. And so we're also we worked this year to integrate uh, our 24/7 helpline uh, with 911. So there, it's an integrated response. So you can you know dial one or the other in our helpline for those who need it, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. That number is 845-485-9700. 845-485-9700. Call or text for assistance. Uh, and um, and I think that that's uh, you know obviously critically important, uh, and at the same time uh, we are continuing our crisis intervention and mental health first aid training so that we can get people who may uh, may know of individuals who are dealing with mental health concerns active and engaged. We continue to train uh, school district officials uh, through uh, 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 trauma informed care. It's a it's a it's a, a training uh, training program we have with school officials. So we're doing all of these things, but I recognize we recognize that we have to tell people the tools exist and get them out there more. And I just encourage folks to visit DuchessNY.gov uh, for uh, all of the resources that are available, and we'll continue to promote it. But it is a priority for us. We believe in this county. You meet people where they are. Everyone's dealing with something, and you've got to be sure that you have the right tool at the right moment, and that's uh, really uh, been what we, we're focused on. The last I will mention, and Greg knows this, and, and you can you can reemphasize it. Uh, we also expect uh, through the litigation that was brought against uh, opioid companies, drug uh, pharmaceutical companies, Dutchess was one of the earliest, one of the first counties to bring litigation against the pharmaceutical companies that took advantage of people 
uh, with uh, uh, with these pain medications, these uh, 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 prescription drugs. Uh, we are securing certain settlements. Uh, there will likely be several million dollars, actually more like uh, $15 million over 30 years. Uh, but those dollars, uh, we are guaranteeing, will be invested in mental health and drug treatment programming. Right. As, as the legislature gets uh, more information coming about these settlements, um, you know, we're going to have that discussion on, on what is best to use that the, the money for, but it will every cent of it will be used um, for the mental health and, and, and um, uh, addiction uh, crisis that we, we face. And we uh, will be talking about some new initiatives in the 2022 budget in, in just the weeks ahead as we finalize the development of uh, that. I do want to get back to the question uh, that Rick had. You can visit uh, cdc.gov. <coughs> CenterForDiseaseControl.gov, CDC.gov, and it is the VAERS uh, report. It is Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System, and you can visit online uh, to see the, that impact um, uh, as well. Um, I do want to get to uh, Mary and East Fishkill next. Just give us, uh, uh, why don't we bring up Mary? She had a qu question regarding uh, FEMA assistance. Mary, are you there? Uh, yes. I was wondering if Dutchess County has applied for FEMA or were they turned down or what? I have to uh, A very, a very good question. Storm. So um, to make things even more complicated than they need to be, uh, uh, when a storm like Ida uh, hits a community like ours, there, there are actually um, sort of three levels of assistance. <clears throat> One is um, sort of the basic FEMA assistance. They come in, they just give you some 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 basic support and access to some loans, etc. The other is um, public assistance. Public assistance is not to be confused with personal or individual. Uh, these are for uh, public assistance funding is for uh, government related damage, government projects, highway, bridges, roads, and then individual assistance. That's the one maybe you're more concerned about, right? That is the aid to individual yes. families and businesses that may have been impacted. Each of those categories, right. so what, this, what the federal government does is says to a region, um, when you exceed a certain amount, a dollar amount of, of damage and a certain number of, of damaged uh, you know, points, you can then qualify. Dutchess County does qualify for the public assistance. That, that, was, uh, that was reached uh, late last week. So public assistance has been approved, which means bridge repair, highway repair, that's, that is going to be uh, funded uh, as, as much as 75% of the damage. Individual assistance, we continue to press the federal government, and frankly, I think that they are missing the boat on this because they, they, I think they think that because we were not impacted as broadly as other counties, that Mary, your impact is is not as is is not as impactful. It is. So what we've done is compiled all of the damage we know of for individuals, businesses, and homes, and we've made we're making the case to FEMA that continues again uh, today. Uh, uh, in fact, I think FEMA was on the ground uh, today with us. I we're, 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 we're actually visiting individual locations saying, see, this is the real damage. We are hopeful that within the next seven days, uh, FEMA will add us to the individual assistance category, and then residents and small businesses would have access to that aid. That has not yet been approved by the federal government, but we are actively fighting for it because we believe it's necessary. So I hope that answered the question. I appreciate it. Uh, we continue to push at it. And if you are on the line today and have a question, if you're on the phone, dial zero. Um, um, dial zero, and uh, we'll have to be happy to bring you live for a, a question. You're on the phone and live today. Oh, I'm sorry, Mary. You're just still a follow up. Oh, go right ahead. Yeah. Uh, I was just wondering, it's, uh, assuming that uh, they get uh, individual um Okay, yes. individual. Then would uh, people be notified? Yes. Uh, how? What would be the um, the way that people would be notified? How would you find out about it? Uh, so uh, a couple things. Um, uh, one, we would we'd be pushing it out via uh, uh, on the county's website, uh, email, uh, tell uh, uh, you know in the media, the, the traditional places that you can find it. Um, if you have not already, uh, we did ask residents to visit duchessny.gov, the county website. There's a survey uh, that I'm pretty sure is still available, and that does include giving us your contact information so we can notify you. So visit duchessny.gov. If you, The survey should be readily available. If you don't see that, then just email my office and we'll be sure to uh, get you the right uh, contact information so that you're on the list to be notified once uh, we know, and hopefully we do. Uh, that uh, that the uh, uh, individual assistance has been approved. 
So uh, thanks for that question, uh, Mary. Uh, we appreciate it. Um, there were a couple questions uh, online that we'll pro let's try to address. We talked a little bit about some of the mental health services underway. I do want to say this. Uh, one of uh, the commenters uh, referred to the tragic uh, uh, death by suicide of uh, Kyle Vanderwater, um, someone that I, I only came to know in some detail uh, when he ran for Congress, um, veteran. Uh, local uh, community member uh, did uh, die by suicide. Um, uh, very tragic. Uh, we obviously are very heartbroken for his family. But this does also uh, show a continued concern among the veterans community and, 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 and mental health resources. So I will tell you that Adam Roach, uh, who is the Director of Veteran Services, does a tremendous job connecting people with services. We continue to fund and, and expand our vet to vet program through Mental Health America. In the 2022 budget, we are expanding some of those services, including additional support for Vet Zero, uh, which is um, uh, an organization founded by <clears throat> Tommy Zerhelen, who focused on veteran suicide and, and, and mental health, trying to create new transportation opportunities for veterans to get the services they need. We'll talk a little bit about that. And we are likely to expand, and I'm pretty sure we're going to be expanding some of our uh, services with Mental Health America for veterans, we, uh, again, providing that uh, expansion. There is little question that America has not done its best for those veterans returning. Uh, and certainly the, um, uh, the, this, the, the decisions and uh, the, the deaths and images from Afghanistan um, have really come home and hit hard a number of our veterans. Uh, in fact, you and I will be participating in a, a veterans roundtable later this week. Right. I say roundtable. It's actually veterans who are coming in. Uh, they're traveling up the Hudson River, and we're having a bit of a roundtable with them at Quiet Cove right. to talk through some of these issues as well. Right. If you wanted to add to that. Yeah, you know, it's, um, <clears throat> it's always tragic when, when somebody um, takes their own life, um, and uh, we are well aware of what veterans are, are going through, um, and we are trying to reach out as much as we possibly can. Um, and certainly Kyle Vanderwater's legacy will be adding to that. We will make sure in his memory that we will be doing more and more as we would for any veteran um, that took their own life. Yeah, and thank you for, uh, for that. And we're going to continue to press on this issue. We know how valuable and important uh, it is, and we also know how critical it is we provide assistance uh, to, to our veterans, and we're going to do better by, by them here in this county. A couple questions uh, that have come up regarding uh, the mandates in daycare. So let's talk about that. And by the way, this is Greg walked in today. It, it uh, caused a little bit of a stir in my office. Um, there are things we have opinions about. Correct. Uh, Greg and I agree that uh, vaccination should be uh, by choice. Right. Um, it's fair to say that we don't. We agree that it shouldn't be mandated by employment. Um, we also think that under the circumstances, I think there are mitigation steps that can be taken that don't require young people to wear masks. Correct. Whether I agree with that or not, um, there the county government for which we are responsible. And again, can I, I can so much. I can have an opinion. <laughs> right. And and but believe me, if I were a state legislator, I could have a different opinion. I have an opinion that 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 and only that I do have to uh, uh, live within the construct of a county government responsible for overseeing some of these some of these departments. Those mandates that have been placed on school districts and on daycares come from Albany. Uh, now, the governor claims through uh, uh, the health department uh, she is able to, and the commissioner of health is able to issue certain mandates. When it comes to daycares, there are two kinds of daycares in the state of New York, those that are certified and licensed by the state of New York and those that aren't. Those that are certified and licensed by the state of New York were ordered by the licensing agency. I think it's OCFS, Office of Children and Family Services. They were told that as part of their licensing, children um, uh, un uh, un under four, two to four, um, would need to wear masks. Um, we highly disagree. The World Health Organization highly disagrees. And we advise daycare providers that while we don't license them, we are not certainly going to enforce this. And we gave them some steps they could take uh, to, to mitigate, which is sort of liberal use of, you know, you, you, you shouldn't have a mask on if you're, uh, if you're, if you're eating, if right. you're sleeping. If you're engaged in heavy activity as a as a child, so what else do they do? Exactly. <laughs> um, so, but for those that are not licensed by the state and and are overseen by the Department of Health, okay. So for those 
uh, that are licensed that are overseen by the county's Department of Health. We are not under that order, and the state didn't say we were under that order. So we say there is no mask requirement among, uh, and certainly we are not asking that that it be uh, uh, followed. We think it's inappropriate, and I told the governor so. Uh, I just don't think we don't think it's appropriate. So for those that are licensed by the state, the county Department of Health, there is no uh, enforcement, nor is there any mandate, and we're not we're not doing that. So I do think that's important. We think it's critical. Young people, listen, what the World Health Organization says is that there are mitigation steps that can be taken that are better and more appropriate than asking a child who likely can't tolerate it and ultimately will have a negative uh, developmental impact uh, wearing a mask. I also think that in school settings, you could achieve the same the same goal. The difference is schools are, are mandated by the State Department of Education right. and the State uh, Department of Health. I no county has the ability to undo that. We can tell you what we think, but we don't have the ability to undo it, and and so that's what we're what we're dealing with. But on the case of daycare, we're very clear: uh, those that uh, we are responsible for for licensing and mandate and and overseeing, we are not imposing any such restriction. Uh, and for those we're not, we're trying to give advice as to as to liberally apply it. Right. Does that make sense? Makes perfect sense. I try. <laughs> um, did get a question, will the county administer COVID booster shots when they're approved by the FDA? I mean, the short answer is yes. Um, in fact, let's also bring Laura in. Laura's from LaGrangeville. She had a question uh, regarding uh, the testing at the Pepsi yes. Gallery. Go ahead, Laura. Well, I, I was very, very upset with the state mandates of asking us if we're not vaccinated to have weekly testing. Mm -hmm. To keep my job, I'll be honest with you, I'm going to have to do it, but I totally disagree with it. Um, because I have been working for a year and a half, responsible adult, washing my hands. I've been around a lot of people who have been vaccinated that have gotten COVID. I have been COVID free. And I believe it has a lot to do with common sense. And I do not feel that the governor should be mandating and telling us what to do. Okay, you're giving abortion people, you can kill a baby. And a woman can have a choice about killing a baby, but we cannot have a choice about putting something that we don't know is going to affect us in the future into our bodies. Totally disagree with that. I'm willing to go for weekly testing, but I want the employer to supply us with an easy way. I have to go once a week out of my way to do this. I'm perfectly healthy. So I just want to know if at the Galleria, if I show up on Saturday morning, that I can just drive through, do the tests that I'm being asked to do a week, a weekly, and see is that there's other places, but I really don't. Our employer is not giving us. They told us to call the Department of Health. Yes. They're not really helping us. Yeah. And I disagree with that. If you were if you were telling me that I have to do this to keep my job, then you have to help us. Well, I do agree. They're just saying it's a state mandate. It's a state mandate. Right, and, and just so you know, what the county said uh, to uh, to the governor's office was, if you require the testing mandate, you have to make sure tests are available. And the problem is, the testing infrastructure was not entirely available. That said, to answer your question specifically, if you go to the Poughkeepsie Galleria or uh, the CVS location in Dover, um, you can't drive through, but you can walk in, get your test, and leave. There is no other expectation. Uh, it's a walk-in clinic. Uh, and, and you can get your test with your results and, and head back to work. We do think that the state should have made a, a much better effort to ensure there was access. I don't know how they think people can get tested weekly. And by the way, and this is actually to those who um, have concern about the county providing this access, the, the, the other is that your insurance company is not required uh, to give it to you for free. And so you could have a scenario where if you don't have some other access, you're forced to pay for this. And again, all of this becomes compounding uh, and, and, and terribly complicated and, and unnecessarily so. Again, our position has been, um, you know, eight, 18 months ago, you, we may have had a different view because we didn't know certain things. We know certain things now. You're right. Personal hygiene, control of your own, uh, of your own health conditions, screening of health uh, conditions, um, uh, cohorting in a building so that maybe, maybe in a tight, tight uh, office you might keep people a little, a little bit uh, away from each other. Taking steps, uh, there are steps that you can take to mitigate uh, uh, the spread of the virus. Why go to the extreme measure? That is a decision of the state. It's not one that we agree with, uh, but we are trying to create the access so that people uh, have um, uh, have a chance to uh, to at least live through this uh, particular mandate without uh, uh, calling to question their employment. Um, if you have a question, uh, dial zero 
Uh, why don't we get to Kay or, or Kayla at Red Hook. Uh, she had a question regarding um, an organization that's mandating vaccinations. Go ahead. Kay, if you're with us. Yes. Go right ahead. What's your question? My question is, and maybe you've already covered it with the mandate. That's fine. So my employer is mandating um, vaccine or be terminated. And I want to know what options I have because I do not want to be vaccinated. I do not want them to dictate exactly what vaccine I should have. And um, I don't know what my options are. I don't want to be unemployed. And that brings up another issue because, in fact, I work in the healthcare system. And so they're going to terminate quite a few um, health care workers, including nurses and doctors, and then have um, imported retired nurses or people from other states to come in to, to you know, compensate for the shortage. And I, I'm just so mind-boggled how this could be because, and as a lot of people have said, and yourself, that, you know, there are a lot of issues. I'm not opposed to having weekly testing. I'm not opposed to um, any of those other restrictions, but to mandate me to be vaccinated if I don't want to be we, is well, a problem. Yeah, so we, we, we've said, and, and, and I appreciate it, we agree with you. Uh, we don't think the mandate is appropriate or necessary. They do currently uh, believe they have the right to under the under the state order, and so if you're in the healthcare community, what the state is ordering is that is that is that mandated vaccination requirement. Now the governor also said if you if you find yourself unemployed that they'll deny you unemployment access. I don't think that that is is constitutionally protected in the state either. I mean the state constitution uh, protected uh, either. So the short answer is you know employees should be pushing uh, their state legislators and others to take action to to at least try to strip, if you believe this, strip that authority away from, from the state. But, at, you know, again, our, you know, our, our view is we share, the, we share your position, but the county government doesn't have the ability to undo this. So uh, we're hopeful that with the reduction in, if cases start to come down and we show uh, clearly statewide that this is just, uh, we're, we're headed in the right direction again, perhaps some of these uh, mandates will be lifted, but it is a mandate that's being imposed by the state of New York. In certain cases, employers are a requirement. Under state law, currently employers can require these things. Uh, we just don't think it's necessary or appropriate in this case. The other is to your point regarding health care providers. You, you are correct. Without question, over the last uh, 20 months, public and private health care providers have been heroes. Day to, uh, uh, direct care workers with those, uh, for, for those with uh, disabilities and our seniors have been heroes. And we've been able to mitigate the, transition, the transmission of the virus in those settings by taking these other steps. Um, again, telling somebody they need to do something that that um, that affects their body or their health, you know, should come with a pretty high standard. You should have a pretty high expectation as to why that's necessary. And if the answer is well, because you know, no one can tell us what the end is. And so, from our perspective, if we're keeping cases down in hospitalizations, if we're not seeing a broad transmission of the virus, well, then there aren't extreme measures that are necessary, and that's something that we think is uh, is you know should should definitely uh, be reconsidered. So we don't we don't disagree with you. I just don't have the ability to undo uh, what the state of New York is ordering at this moment. The state legislature can, and I encourage you please to reach out to your state legislators because they are the ones that could potentially uh, put pressure on the on the governor and of course change state law and state policy. So we're wrapping up at the end of the town hall meeting. We appreciate you joining us. We have uh, we have a series of town hall meetings that were scheduled uh, for a budget presentation and otherwise, if you want to share them with us. Sure. Yeah. Um, something we've done for the last few years is, is taking the budget on a road show around the county. Uh, gives people a, a perspective. Uh, October 18th uh, at 3 p.m. at the Poughkeepsie Senior Center. October 19th at 6 p.m. at the Beekman Recreation Center. October 20th in my district at 6 p.m. at the Wilcox Memorial Hall in Milan, and November 9th at 6 p.m. at the East Fishkill Town Hall. I encourage um, everybody to attend and ask all the questions they need to ask. And on the 27th of October at 5.30, we'll be back with a telephone and uh, Facebook Live uh, town hall meeting for you. If you have questions in the meantime, please feel free 
uh, to reach us uh, through uh, the social media platforms or reach out uh, to our offices uh, via email or phone. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, we thank you for joining us this evening. Sorry uh, we couldn't get to all questions. We tried to get to as many as we could. Uh, please uh, stay healthy, uh, be strong, and uh, be kind to each other.